Okay. That, that voice you heard was Craig Connor, so I'm going to turn over to Michael here because I'm not going to be able to get a word in edgewise here with you. No, 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 Tom, you have some great questions fans. lined up. I have scribbles all over Craig's book. It's an honor and a pleasure to have Craig hey, Hodges Craig back. Craig Hodges. You were on uh, Live from the Heartland show a few years back with uh, our friend James, uh, the giant painter. Yes. And um, uh, it's great to have you back. You're on kind of a book tour. You have a new book out called Long Shot. It's a uh, long shot, the triumphs and struggles of an NBA freedom fighter. Right. So uh, let's start off, uh, you grew up in Chicago Heights, and uh, what are the first uh, memories you have of being a freedom fighter? I know you talked about your school, Gavin School. Right. Uh, tell us a bit about what uh, put you on the path to being a conscious, uh, politically oriented, uh, principled human being. Well, with this being uh, Easter weekend, I want to thank God for giving us a chance to come across their ways and of course they're sacred and our message has to be one of solution based so for me growing up in the heights I had my family raised me and my mom was part of the civil rights movement my granny who I consider a saint to this day Lord rest her soul and my granddad as, as well they were both very supportive in as far as what we were able to do as, as a family and for me it was uh, you know getting to do petition drives and knocking on doors. So we would get a stack of flyers that we would have to pass out before we went to play baseball or basketball. So it wasn't really anything like we were actually doing anything special. We were just getting a chance to go ahead and get our work done so we could go play. Uh -huh. When I had a chance to look back at it, when I got to Long Beach State and studied black studies, I was able to see that even at that point in time, I was a part of the movement unknowingly and as I got older, I was able to see some of the reasons why the movement was necessary, as well as being able to see what role I could play in furthering it, and even hopefully get a, get a chance to see what the ultimate goal of our struggle really is, because to me, that's the biggest element of what our struggle is, is that when we're playing basketball or a sport, we know what the end result is, whoever scores the most points wins. But within the context of us as black people, we have never tasted liberty. We have never tasted justice on a holistic level, so we don't know what that tastes like, we don't know what that looks like, we don't know what it is. Once we reach that measure, what will it be? So that's my part in it as far as uh, being raised with a certain measure of knowing that community is your family and not taking that lightly. And so when I had a chance to go to school and play in the NBA, it was with the understanding that some of my homeboys who were better than me aren't getting a chance to play. Some of my good friends who are uh, great people aren't getting to see the sights that I get to see. So when we're seeing life, we're seeing it through the loved ones and the freedom fighters who did things that you didn't get a chance to do, but it took you to a further place. Uh, you know, you, you talk a lot about uh, the influences that uh, helped you along your path of being a a uh, longtime freedom fighter. One of them is uh, when you ended up uh, following Tex Winter, who, who tried to recruit you to, to, Northwestern. to Northwestern, and then he went out to Long Beach State, Absolutely. and you went there. And you talk about the role that Ron Karenga and uh, the US organization. In, in the book, you do talk about the Nation of Islam, you talk about the Black Panther parties. Uh, you know, you're pretty good on all of them. I, uh, I just remembered as I was reading that there was a rift between the Panthers and yes. uh, Ron Karenga, right, right. and I wondered, uh, you don't address that in the book at all, but no, Karenga I, comes off really good in your book. Yeah, absolutely. For me, you know, <clears throat> and for me, um, I take things at face value. So when uh, the first instruction I got in college, my first professor was Dr. Malana Karenga, and teaching us the principles of Kwanzaa, teaching us the uh, fundamentals of why it's important for you to study yourself. And when, in studying, Counterintelligence program that under J. Edgar Hoover. COINTEL Pro. Co Those guys. Pro. So we could, we could see that it was infiltrated on both sides, whether it was the Panthers or whether it was the us. Always. Whether yeah, was, good you know, point. So the bottom line is that when you were speaking earlier about the chemicals that are being dumped, one of my things is when I look in the sky and I see chemtrails, uh -huh. I'm saying, what is this? And then the other day I'm saying that. In one case, they're saying it's benzene. 
mm -hmm. which is deadly. And in another case, they were saying it's the uh, aluminum uh, oxide or nitrogen, some crazy stuff, or whatever it is. Those are the types of things that I ponder about. <laughs> and what can we do as a human family to create a better, a better climate, if nothing else, than, than what it is today? There's a lot we can do. We cover it all the time. You know, and, and it's and it, it we are up against it. We have to do everything now. Science I mean, is violence. We have to do everything. We've got a guy in DC who's trying to overturn stuff that you know, so it's just we have to have a, a, a posture of we're not going back. And and, and that's going back, uh, that's a great point <laughs> to think about when uh, the main slogan was make America great again. The guys in the office who wants to make America great again. My point is, at which point in time do you go back historically to say America was great again, and then let me as a black man challenge to say where we were as yeah. a people at that same point where you were saying great. Right. So when I look at the gold uh, trappings that go along with this whole thing, I know that it's a it's a spiritual point where we are right now. That the whole of it is taking us to a whole new paradigm. So I just ask everybody that's listening, don't be so frightened by what you see. Don't be so don't let don't let the fear factor paralyze you from movement, paralyze you from speaking, and just paralyze you in general. And that's the and that's the part for me that is so Amen. Scary. Your book talks not only about your basketball career but these political currents that were going on when right. you were playing. Today, the frame coming out of the Occupy movement would be right. Black Lives Matter. Right. What advice would you give to today's activists based on your experience okay. and trying to be the best you could as a basketball player but with a political right. consciousness? And now, like I was going on the way over here, I'm talking to one of my boys who dropped me off to go do another radio show. And I told another him, radio yeah, show. Yeah, he's doing. You're seeing another radio show. But it's all it's all in the spiritual connection. So it has to be done because we can't be all. Has to be done. Amen. Amen. So what I was telling him is that now, it's almost when I when I'm doing my book tour and when I'm answering questions and I was at a um, uh, new beginning yesterday in Baltimore with at the youth detention center. Mm -hmm. So when we're doing making movements like that, it's very important, man. So. It's nothing that I take lightly, and I think more importantly that now it's that climate where young folks understand their power, and they understand the power of their togetherness as well as being able to speak and speak freely. I think that's one of the things, the drawbacks of my generation was we are so caught into making our own monies that we weren't we weren't in we weren't in compassion mode, and. I love Black Lives Matter, but I does I don't want it to become a cliche as opposed to it being a another uh, another branch of the movement, and it, and the root of it being in the freedom fighters that have gone on before us, mm -hmm. and not and that was one of the reasons I wrote my book was that I didn't want to come off reactionary in Black Lives Matter because I had a lot of people ask me to come speak to different young folks about Black Lives Matter, and it's bigger than Black Lives Matter. It's bigger than that because I think we're losing a lot of the historical relevance that went on that lets us know we don't have to, we don't have to have your stamp of approval. And to some degree, I feel like we're asking people who we know don't love us to give us some measure of appreciation. You don't have to tell me my life matters. That, that just the fact that I'm here lets me know that the Creator is blessing me with the air to breathe to let me know that my life matters. So the only difference between us, the reason we have to say Black Lives Matter is because we are the only people that have people who tell us who our leaders are. Mm -hmm. So in terms of this, people can tell us what our struggle is. So in some circles, I'm, I'm I love it, but there are certain tentacles of it that are inspired, are going, are starting to move into certain areas that I don't want to really class hold to. Mm -hmm. And I say that from this matter. It's, it's the exact same thing of time counter. Okay. Black Lives Matter has some factions of it 
that are being financed through invisible monies. I don't like that because what we need today is transparency. Mm -hmm. So when Jim Brown, uh, Steve Harvey, and our black brothers go to Trump, what happened? What was said? Was there any video? Was there any audio? Was there any transcripts? That'd be a big no. That'd be a big no. And the question no. becomes, and I ask that because it matters. Mm -hmm. And that's where, when a black lives matter, that's when black lives matter, because I need to know what we're talking about in these secret operations. And that is that another part of the counterintelligence program? Mm -hmm. That are we, are we just moving in, a, in another, more sophisticated manner with it? And that's why this, these types of forums, the type of forum that my other brother went to are so critical, that they give us that, you know it's cool when they talk fake news. That's yeah. all I study. Because <laughs> <laughs> the whole cold piece is you told me everything that I've studied this far was the truth. So I want to go the opposite of that. So I'm going to go see what you're telling me that's fake. I'm going to look at that and, and be able to look at it in a, in a holistic way, man. That's Greg, in your book, uh, you, you do talk a lot about the importance of understanding black history. You talk about members of the NBA and your fellow players who really got it and those who don't. Right. Um, and why don't you share with our listeners uh, what you think that uh, your involvement in uh, civil rights, your consciousness, your speaking mm -hmm. out, uh, what relationship that played to the NBA uh, and kind of ending your career when you were the best three-point shooter in the league. So when we look at um, Trump doing that thing, he said some crazy stuff on the bus, right? And it comes back and he says, like, locker room chatter. Yeah. So locker room chatter has, happens on a lot of levels. These conversations that we're having about race, these conversations that we're having about politics, economics, it goes on in the locker room, it goes on on the bus, it goes on on the plane. So it's not a matter that we aren't conscious to it. It's a matter of us not speaking publicly about our positions on it. And many times it's hard for us to think in terms of being able to speak on behalf of people because it's not financially uh, relevant to our own choice at that time. But to me, the athlete today, LeBron, he understands it. Obviously, Colin gets it. Um, the, and that's, that's where it becomes the thing where I was talking, speaking to the young folks yesterday, is that it's a soft pedal approach at times because very people that are paying you these crazy salaries, whether it be your endorsement or whether it be your contract to play, they're not in stepping in line with the conscious and compassion that we're talking about. So. When we're talking about National Basketball Association, when we're talking about National Football League, when we're talking about Major League Baseball, they have to play a major role in this thing, man. So yeah. when we talk about, consider the fact of how many players from the Dominican Republic and from different areas of the planet that come here to make a living and we're able to send coaches there to send coaches to Europe, so you have an influx of players like Manu Ginobili, Powell Gasol, that's because the NBA took an active mindset to expand this thing in the 70s, at that point when NBA meant nothing but Africans. Right. You know, and that in that, they said we have to expand our approach because it's not cool to have a black product that's being consumed by all white people. <laughs> and oh in goodness. that, we have to bring in, so in 1979, you had Magic Johnson and Larry Bird, the perfect, perfect storm of us coming, the National Basketball Association being nothing but African. Mag Magic represents that. The league trying to bring more white fans to bring your children to the game. That was Larry Bird. Converse took the advantage of it and made it a, a rivalry. Bird, the, the good guy, magic, the bad guy. And it's the ultimate play on it, man. Hey, I, I, I can't help it. I, I, I don't want to take away from uh, Keep going. the incredible activism no, that you just no described. And you have definitely, you win with the longest answers to Sorry Michael's that. questions that I've ever heard. <laughs> Triple-double. Talk about it. It happened this week, right? Well, 
Nope, you don't like it? <laughs> triple, when you say triple double, yeah. they talk to me. So, so Channel 11 guy said double triple. <laughs> when you say he did? Twice, yeah, oh. on national. Well, it, it's just, I love the concept of a full player. One who gets rebounds as right. well as shoots right. as well right. as right. Right. helps, That's and and, and I, okay. I love that okay. notion. Okay. So okay. no one no one knows about it. And the guy who last did it, who was also on the news, I loved that he was. I, I forget his Oscar name. Robert, Oscar Robertson. Oscar Robertson. Robert. He was eloquent. Uh, Fifty some years it right. took to break yes. that record. And you know what's so wild with it is that uh, I applaud Westbrook for what yeah. he's done, and I felt Kobe could have did it. Uh, yeah. And I talked to Kobe about it. I was like, uh, Kobe, you should go do a triple double. He didn't double. try. He's like, man, I don't do triple doubles. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I guess that's like I don't do uh, triples at Wendy's or something. I don't do a double. I do double double. You know, and, and I think, I that's think funny. It, I think in terms of that, it's one of those things where. <laughs> And, and Russell played the game with such ferocity. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. You know I, I, mean? I wasn't really aware of him yeah. until I... And, and one of the yeah. things that oftentimes he can go a little bit overboard in that he's so fierce in his competitiveness that it, it sometimes uh, comes across as he takes the game a little too personal. Yeah. But all in all, he had, a, he had an awesome season. Let me just ask you one last yes. little quick question. Uh, I'll be quick on my answer. Ah, what's, uh, <laughs> what's your sense of uh, the consciousness of the players in the league? Not just black players, but uh, even some of these Europeans and right. some white guys. Right. I mean, you did have a no Canadian, question. Steve Nash, no who question. was a progressive guy. And, and, and we do look forward to a kind of a rainbow coalition of consciousness. It is. It is. So what's your sense of the and current players? Yeah. Football, basketball? Across the board. I think, um, you know, Popovich is, is the main thing. He's good. He, he was around. An athletes united for Absolutely. peace in the old days. Absolutely, and that's the biggest part of it is that, and I think across the board, it's a rainbow coalition already, brother, and I think, you know, we we in our different areas have to bring that to the table, and we have to bring the, bring our grievances to the table along with everybody else, and um, do what's necessary. It's all about uh, people, man, and I want to thank you as well as uh, your listening audience for, you know, being supportive of me and my, and my writing journey. <laughs> But all in all, I want to just, you know, thank well, you. Well, we encourage all of our Thank listeners you. to get this book, Long Shot, The Triumphs and Struggles of an NBA Freedom Fighter, Craig Hodges, along with Rory Fanning. That's another story in itself. Yes, We're going to have is. him on the show. Uh, Craig, it's an honor and a pleasure to, to be with totally. you. Totally. And uh, we're going to see you more often. You're coaching high school now. Yes, Richie's High School, Park Forest, Illinois. Come check us out. It's we're going to come and see you play. Sure, <coughs> you are listening you to Live Thanks from the Heartland, 88.7 FM. We're here every Saturday.